Hello and welcome to the Road to Psychology podcast. I am your host, Deirdre Ferriter. I am an assisted psychologist, trainee therapist and your fellow traveller on the Road to Psychology. I wanted to thank everyone for your support over the last couple of years. It's been such an amazing journey so far. And also to say that I've started a Buy Me A Coffee page. So this show will always be free and that's really important to me, but the show isn't free to make. So if you can contribute, if the show has made a difference to you or helped you in any way, I'd really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. On this week's episode, we have Dr. Tony Bates. Tony is a clinical psychologist. He's the founder of Headstrong that went on to become Jigsaw. He's an author of many books. He's credited with bringing mindfulness to Ireland. And Tony was also one of the lead authors of the Vision for Change policy. Tony's career has spanned decades and we had a really wide ranging conversation ranging from the Power of Threat Meaning Framework, the Catholic Church in Ireland, Tony's books and much, much more. I really hope you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed me and Tony's conversation. So I'd like to welcome Tony Bates, a clinical psychologist and all around great human being. How are you, Tony? Great. Thanks for doing That's this today. Flattering. Thank you, Deirdre. Love- yeah, thank you so much, Tony. Um, yeah, so the first thing I wanted to discuss was your book, um, Depression, The Common Sense Approach. I really, really love the book. I read it. I hadn't realized it was published in 1999, but I felt that it was kind of like someone taking your hand and like kind of speaking in a whisper. <laughs> I really felt like it was a, it would help someone going through depression, whereas I feel a lot of books at the moment on that topic are kind of very stats heavy or, you know, there's a lot of information there where it was very practical. It gave practical examples of people who experienced depression and that kind of stuff. So I really, really loved it. Um, is there anything about your views of depression that have changed since writing the book? Well, it's funny you ask because I'm writing another book at the moment and, and just so happens the last two weeks I've been writing my depression chapter. So I, the book is, is, is it's kind of looking at different aspects of my own life and also at the same time looking at subjects like psychosis trauma um and and uh, you know pulling together what i learned about those things and maybe what i think needs to be happening now in, in society so so i i but the difference is i ground every discussion every chapter in a person's story my own person's story and and i i think that as somebody said a very good critic of that book that what's missing entirely is any sense of me I mean, you know, I was just so terrified to 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 to, to kind of spill my guts or to, to to sound like I was talking about me. I never did. I, I did everything I could to keep the subjective out of it. Um, but you know, I wrote this eleven thousand ch- word chapter, and you know, it, it's it was a, a, a very much more <laughs> gripping account of depression because uh, I really dove very deep. Um, and, you know, I asked myself the question why I never took medication. Uh, other people had to pay the price for that, I think. I was, I, was, I was dreadful. I mean, I was just so locked into a crazy place in my head that I, I was totally insensitive to my wife and children. And, um, and yet I was going into the University of Pennsylvania and being a cognitive therapist, you know, um, and I knew what to ask, I knew what to say, but I'd come home every evening crying on the, the train. You asked me, do I think about it differently? I, I think what I think about is that depression is, is, I've always said for me, it was an adverb, it's a state of mind. But whereas before I thought it was a very unfortunate state of mind and a very dysfunctional one, and maybe even a very disordered, medically unwell one. I don't think of it that way anymore. Um, I think now uh, uh, it's a bit like what um, Lucy Johnson said in the workshop on Saturday. I, I, it's a verb, you know, that I, I depress myself because in reaction to pain and trauma and unresolved things, I need to stop myself feeling so bad. So I push down my dopamine levels. I push down, I I retard my behavioral motivational things so that I'm not using as much energy out in the world. And it's a kind of reaction, an adaptive reaction to feeling horrible, not knowing why, feeling powerless. Um, And so, and I think then you can get very easily stuck in that state. You can become, it can become your, 
go-to place when things feel bad. And then, it, and it happens more and more easily. So it is, there is a sort of biological level to this, of course. But I think the biological um, change that we witness there is much more um, a reaction and an adaptive reaction than it is, you know, to go from that to say, well, there's some sort of freestanding independent disease process for me is not justified. I don't see that. I, I don't, we haven't found it. The, you know, we know this from DSM, the chairman. We, there are no biomarkers for depression that we don't know. There are, are certainly hormonal profiles, but they are perhaps as much a reaction as, as a cause. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, and, I, and I, I do think the danger of the medical model of depression is that it entirely takes people out of the context of their life and it, it makes them strangers to themselves. They don't get to deal with the issues that are causing this pain or provoked it in the first place, which could be a very early unresolved trauma or it could be a current uh, stress situation, bullying, abuse, whatever in their lives so but once you've you know diagnosed major depression the tendency is to say well okay we now know what's going on and all we need to do is treat that so the person becomes even more alienated from themselves and I think that's very damaging yeah that's really interesting I didn't pick that up in the book but then I'm just thinking um I had listened to other podcasts with you before reading the book. So maybe I was putting that context in myself, the personal context kind of. So I didn't, I didn't think that you were absent from the book, but I, I see what you mean. Oh, you didn't talk about your own kind of experience. No, no. I mean, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't unique, but it was, you know, a very major part of my life, you know, and I, and mm -hmm. I certainly took far more than one deep dive into depression. I took several and, and, and now I don't. It's funny. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's what I'm really interested in, that uh, I'm not saying in any way I'm perfect or I'm insane. No, no, I get upset, all the rest of it, but I don't get depressed in that way. And, and I think I was for years, actually. Wow. Um, certainly my wife would say I was for years. Um, doing my damnedest to, to, to put out my best side and genuinely work at things I believed in. When I set up Headstrong, I was in a terrible depression. And my wife often points out that it's important I say that because, you know, that was a time when our marriage broke down. I moved out of home. I was depressed and I set up this youth mental health and I was so ashamed and guilty and up terribly upset. And yet I was turning up and setting up this thing. And, you know, it's important to say that that people are extraordinary resilient and we should never underestimate that and even and, and they're also very good at hiding things you know mm -hmm. um uh, i i was in a lot of pain um but i i blamed myself entirely for that and i felt a terrible sense of shame and remorse and all the rest and so i kind of felt it was what i deserved you know so it didn't even dawn on me that i was quite down i just I was just a bad person. It was very simple. I was being punished by God or whoever. <laughs> and, and, you know, and that's what was going on. And I, you know, but God, I look back on it, you know, I was smoking and drinking and just trying to sleep and I couldn't. And then I had a heart attack. You know, I just, I mean, anyway, it, um, it, uh, it was a, a terrible time. So I, I you know, I, I think I've struggled and I think I've come through it. And I think, my, I think I've really addressed the issues that I was depressing. And, and uh, when I did that, I, I think I understand them. I have a totally different relationship with those parts of myself that were, you know, hidden and mm. disowned and um, it, painful, you know. Um, and they still hurt and they can be raw. They don't all go away suddenly. But they're part of my family now. They're the, I, these little snotty-nosed orphans that we used to put outside the back shed hidden, I now have brought in and they sit around the table and they're all part of me. And mm. I wouldn't have it any other way. You know, I love them all. You know what I yeah. mean? Particularly the really hard times. Because I learned so much from those hard times. That's you know, I've had an easy life. I'd be a banker in Switzerland and just <laughs> make it. Home. That's it. Yeah, because yeah. I was really struck by your interview with um, Helen Shaw on the Family of Things podcast. Helen. Yeah, and the That's Right podcast as well. I'll link them below. But um. They were really honest. I listened to that podcast about three times. I was really struck by just the 
raw honesty of it. Like it was really. And I tell you a funny story about that. I, I, yeah. I love Helen. She's a very dear friend and we're in touch and she's actually helping me a lot with this book because she's sort of given me a, I was lost. I had no structure and she's given me a, a beautiful structure, I think. Um, so, but I was doing a course for the second time with Helen on pod, doing your own podcast, you know, um, and I, I had gone along twice and, and she said, we lived not too far from each other at that stage in Dublin. She said, look, for God's sake, get going and do something, do some bloody podcast on something. And I said, well, I, I, I'm not sure I have the right setup or the right acoustics or the right this or that. Oh, she said, for God's sake. So I got a Zoom 5 um, recorder and she said, look, come up to my house. I'll show you how to set it up and how simple it is. So I went up to her house and I walked in one day at a long walk sat down and it was at the kitchen table and the Zoom was in the middle. And she said, now let's pretend we're doing a podcast. And I said, sure. And she said, can I ask you some things? She said, well, and the first thing I need to get you to sign a release form. She, did. <laughs> and she went through all the motions, you know. Um, and then she said, and then I had absolutely not prepared. And so she said, if I was to ask you about whatever, I think my dad came up and classical music. And I found myself talking about my dad and classical music. And then she went on and it was in completely organic. But the thing was, she probably, well, maybe it has says it on her website. It got um, the bronze statue in Radio City, New York's awards for personal, got number three. Wow. I mean, just like, I didn't think I was that interesting to begin with. <laughs> And certainly we made no big effort to make a great podcast. She did, but she, she edited beautifully and, and uh, Michael Callan gave us some music to use in between the bits. And um, uh, anyway. Yeah, no, it felt like you were kind of a fly on the wall as opposed to like a person in an audience. You were hearing something really unique. Yeah. It, well, that's lovely to hear. I tell her that. I, I tell her that. Well, she'll probably hear your podcast now, but and she will listen. I'll tell you. <laughs> but like looking back now on your career as a therapist, Tony, how do you think those experience experiences helped you or hindered you, or was it hard to look after your own mental well being while caring for others, or do you think it made you stronger? I, I think you know honestly. Um, it was a combination of a number of things. I mean, I worked really hard, you know, and I read everything and I really practiced. I was a very good student. I always accepted supervision and I always brought my worst moments in therapy to supervision, not my best moments. And I was very, I really, I had great supervisors. So there was a lot of things that helped me to become a therapist. But I think one of the key things for me, um, taking a kind of really meta perspective on the whole thing, I would say that I became a psychologist when I finally realized that uh, I wasn't in there to, to help those people. Uh, now, it wasn't just one way traffic, that, that in a way that they played each patient, as we call them, I saw played a unique role in helping me to grow. And, and they showed me what suffering was like, and they showed me what resilience was like and they showed me what keeping secrets did to a person and they showed me what opening up could do and you know I learned so much from the people I worked with and I would say they are what sustained me through very dark times and that's it sounds semi almost unprofessional but I don't think it was I never involved them in any inappropriate way in my own suffering mm -hmm. but they were really helping me and when I saw that I think I discovered what real collaboration means. You know, it was, it was, uh, it really is working together. Um, and that the whole process is a far more human process than it is anything else, and certainly than it is technical. Um, and that, you know, there's a lot of road we have to walk with somebody before we can begin to allow them experience what is most real and important in their lives. Um, so there's a lot of, of, you know, a lot less fixing and an awful lot more listening, I would say, you know, and, and, and not stepping in and not being the expert and all the things I thought I had to do in the beginning, I had to unlearn those. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but uh, yeah, I, and it, it, you know, and, and, and I suppose the one lesson I've always said, to pay, you know, the first thing somebody tells you is never the problem. It's always the second thing. Wow. So the first. So don't get distracted and go after the first 
you know, my wife has broken up with me. No, no, that's not the problem. The problem <laughs> is something else. You know, somebody else has broken up with you. That might be a real problem. Um, or, or why your wife broke up with you. But, you know, it's, it's actually, it's very important to be, um, to be, to be willing to accept how little you know about the person you're sitting with. You know, you have never walked in their shoes to use that cliche but it, it, it is true um you know you don't know what it's really like to be them and 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 that's okay you know and and, and that can be used as a a wonderful asset in the therapy process that I really want to know and yeah. I, I I you know and and I don't understand how that happened tell me more um I, these are very simple things but I think you know, the basics are what come back. Now I read much more psychoanalysis than I used to, and I'm finding it fascinating. I've been reading Lacan and reading um, Beyond, and I find these people wrote with tremendous depth about psychotherapy and, and what was happening. And I kind of wished I'd understood 40 years ago what these people are saying now. And now I understand them, mm -hmm. um, or I'm beginning to, and... Uh, it's 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 poetry you know what i mean a lot of the modern therapies there's quite an emphasis on you know quick fix and six sessions and all this but it's and that's helpful in its own way for many people i mean it serves a function it's not on you know but it's not for me it's not really what psychotherapy is about which is a much longer affair yeah. But it's getting very difficult to find a long term somebody who'll work, you know. In James's, I would work for years with people. I yeah. Mean, really, you know, psychotic and personality disorder and really difficult. But, uh, you know, I had a flow through of, of lots of people and so I saw groups and, it, you know, but then there were those who I saw individually who really needed kind of a deep support. And, um, I think, you know, and then sometimes I saw them over time, you know, then they come back. It's not they came every week, for, you know, but I, I saw one woman who was probably the most wretched case of sex abuse I'd ever seen. Um, and she, she saw me over 10 years. And, you know, it took her, it took us a long time to get to what really had upset her. I thought I knew I didn't. Um, but she's doing super, she, you know, and when I first, but she could not sit with me without prematurely ending a session, running out and vomiting in the toilet. I mean, that was for about nine months. It was that hard. So, you know, like some people need time and, and it's not as neat as, as sometimes the books make it sound or make it sound like it should be, you know? Um, anyway. That's yeah, that makes sense to me. I've like if someone's, it. if someone's been like deprived massively in their early life, it, it makes sense to me that they would benefit from long-term therapy and developing a, a good relationship with a therapist that might be able to kind of help yeah. them. And, and, and I mean, I'd say, you know, intensively for one or two years and then having some kind of intermittent support uh, available to them but but um yeah no I, I think so I think there's and I you know I have and I describe it in when I'm writing now but I you know I have worked with very 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 psychotic people probably the most chronically psychotic person in in the hospital in James's and um you know uh, again I, I didn't do it he did it but he showed me you know that from being a guy, the crazy in the corner, as he described himself, you know, <laughs> corner of the day room. And you do, did, I didn't even see him 19 years. He's in, he's in the whole time, you know, totally psychotic. You know, he became a teacher of mindfulness with me, teaching addicts and uh, other people. And, and he was superb and he got off all medication after 20 years of the most exhaustive um, list of tablets. He got pancreatic cancer, which meant he had to be taken off them. But then he throve. He throve for about a year yeah. and no psychiatric medication, lost five stone and just blossomed. Became a teacher with me. He was just extraordinary. Um, so I, I, I you know, I, I just think um, 
we need much more vision for what's possible in terms of psychological healing. That's a good segue for me there. You mentioned vision. <laughs> what did you say, sorry, Tom? What? I said, yeah, that's a good segue for me. You right. said vision, and I want to talk about a vision for change. <laughs> Oh, God, let's not spend too much time on that. That was, a, well, that was, a, you know, I think psychologists need to get involved in policy. And yeah, I think so, too. Um, you know, uh, what I discovered later on is that there was no money given for anything that didn't fit within Vision for Change. Um, and, and when I set up Headstrong, I knew exactly, you know, all the right, <laughs> all the right phrases to use. Um, I mean, they couldn't, I, I'd written the damn thing, they couldn't deny me, you know, um, uh, I was a big part of writing, obviously, but I, I, they couldn't deny me in any way doubt that I didn't understand exactly what we had to do. And of course, you know, one of the overriding recommendations was to set up more preventative um, interventions for young people and that, that and Jigsaw filled the bill very nicely. And it was just a coincidence, um, but it was, um, you know, a, a lot of what makes something a success is that it's kind of aligned with policy and therefore with funding streams. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it comes down to, no matter how good an idea it is, you've got to be clever in the way you, you, you get it mainlined and mainstreamed. Um, you know, when you went about writing that document, though, Tony, what was what was the actual research? Were you interviewing people on the field, asking them what they needed to? Because I just wonder, I know people can see a document and they can be like, oh, that's so and so policy. There's a new policy now. But like that seemed like a fairly labor intensive process of finding out what was required to provide. A oh, no, no, we, we did. And uh, there, there's a number of um, associated uh, publications with it. One is called What We Heard, I think it is, because we did consultations with 300 service users and very carefully um, you know tabulated what they what they what their experience and what they wanted we also invited recommendations and we had 115 and I remember I had to analyze the 115 and some of them were like really long and I had to figure out a way of categorizing and cataloging all of these recommendations and then I, and all of that is in the opening chapter of the vision for change. But it was heavily researched. And then also we knew that countries like Canada and Australia and New Zealand were, were more were thinking in a new way about things. And they had this notion of recovery, which became a, a kind of a buzzword in Vision for Change. And so all of those had to be thoroughly investigated. But even I, I went over to England to see, oh, he's very torn. Thorn, Thornhill, is it? he's a psychiatrist. He wrote the textbook on community psychiatry. But I went to see him because I wanted to understand how to structure a psychiatric team. And, and here's an interesting and very relevant point. One of the battles we fought was that when you have a multidisciplinary team, it should not necessarily be the psychiatrist who's in charge. The, you know, the, you need a, a key leader. But the person who's the leader needed to have management skills and kind of more holistic. It could be a psychologist, could be a, a nurse. Um, but they needed to demonstrate they had the competence to, in that role. And the psychiatrist would, would still hold medical responsibility. It was, you know, And we fought an awful lot about this. But then the psychiatrist eventually said, yeah, no, that made sense. Because there was one psychiatrist who wanted it like that himself, John Owens. He was very far thinking. The moment we published the document, it went right across psychiatry in Ireland that that was not going to be accepted. That was not going to be allowed to happen. You know, mm -hmm. but if you had that happen, say in the Kerry, South Kerry, you'd have a, a probably more of a multidisciplinary team, and very likely because it would be very attractive to someone with family therapy or other skills would be in there and uh, taking responsibility in the absence of a consultant. Now, and then the junior doctor could maybe get supervision from a consultant in some other county. I mean, you know, they, there's lots of possibilities. So in some ways, the structures we have don't allow for that kind of flexibility. Um, mm. And Vision for Change was really good. It really ahead of its time. I think it was not the end, but it was it was very good. And it, it, um, it really tried to... Uh, you know, kind of insist on psychological therapies being part of uh, every service, you know, that, yeah. that it's not just an added on extra. Um, so it, it yeah, no, I, 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 I was seconded for 15 months full time. I thought this is going to be the doddle of my life because <laughs> I am, 
you know, and at home, my manifesto. <laughs> I think, well, you know, it won't take that long just to gather other people's drafts. I think I edit them, you know. It took me 15 months, I would say 11 hours a day. And I don't think I had, I had one break during that time. It was, it was really intensive work. Um, and uh, Fiona Kyo was worked with me on it too. And we were, our office was next door to Tony Houlihan in the Department of Health. Of course, he was a nobody in those days, but now he's, <laughs> now he's the national prophet, you know, telling us <laughs> how to live. Um, uh, but yeah, no, no, it was, it was very, a uh, very real privilege. Um, and it, uh, yeah, I, I, it, it was, it just seems so long ago, uh, Georgia. Mm. You mentioned um, the Kerry Cam situation, Colleen. obviously like nobody knows the individual cases that were involved in that, but what struck me was that the media and politicians yeah. were immediately jumping to the point that, oh, there has to be a consultant psychiatrist in there. This wouldn't have happened. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a very narrow model because, Everybody says these kids had special conditions and these kids were severely mentally ill and they needed a doctor. Well, I doubt any of those children had difficulties that were beyond understanding, you know, that their their difficulties, like everybody's difficulties, came out of events in their life and experiences that weren't so hot um, and relationships that weren't so easy for them. And all of those things needed attention. Um, But it's when you diagnose a condition, it leaves it all of those issues get sidelined and and all we need to do really is to treat the symptoms with medication and then the problem is sorted. Everything else will magically work out fine. And and that kind of thinking is is very bankrupt, I think. It it does serious injustice to families and children because they will invariably relapse and nothing is being addressed. And psychiatrists say, well, they're just doing their job and you guys need to do yours and do all the therapy stuff. But it's not an even playing ground because they hold all the cards and they hold all the power and they dictate what what happens. And I feel for that young, I don't know who it was, the young doctor involved, because I know that many of those doctors, junior doctors, I supervised in James's, and I know that how afraid they were of what was going on and how... They believed they were they had the responsibility to bring some relief to the situation and they had to do something. And the only thing they had was a prescription pad. They had no other training or skills. And so out of fear, dealing with a population where suicide was the major risk, they, they would do something because afterwards they couldn't be accused that you didn't even prescribe, you know, an anti a sleeping pill for, you know yeah. so they so 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 i think that in a way we give out about psychiatry but we've also set up psychiatry you know we put them in charge of all this pain that's in society um and we've kind of not equipped them to be trained therapeutically so they use the medical model because that's all they got and then when they do we kind of get upset that they're ignoring things mm-hmm. but you know how many families want their children to have a condition and for their condition in no way to reflect on what's happening at home or what's happening in the school, what's happening in the wider society. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think we kind of give out about psychiatry, but we're also very thankful that they find all of these problems are due to a condition that has nothing to do with their life. Um, I think that's troublesome. I, I, I don't think it's going to be sustainable into the future, but um, um, anyway, I think the yeah. power of meaning framework is important in, the, in that it's trying to challenge that in a, in a less hostile, more evidence-based way. Yeah, like some, there's obviously a newer policy sharing the vision and some critics of that have stated that it devalues psychology. Do you think psychology is vocal or valued enough in our system. I suppose you've covered that a bit, but I suppose, like, do you think the psychology community? Um, I, I, I was, I, I was critical. Uh, yeah, I think what, um, I think, the, I don't think there were any therapists or clinicians or psychologists certainly on, um, and that's again, why it was so good to be on the vision for change. There was no psychological thinking in, in sharing the vision. And I think they, they got trapped into a misperception that look at, People need to talk, but your God knows they can talk to anyone. I mean, it's it's not that different. Talk to 
Deirdre talked to Tony, talked to anybody else, um, uh, an OT, uh, a nurse, uh, you know, social worker, psychologist. It, it's all the same, you know, basically they're all doing the same thing. And, and I think there was absolutely no appreciation for how uh, complex some psychological problems are and how, how skillful people need to be in the art of psychotherapy in order to resolve them. Now, my problem is that I'm not rushing in with psychology at my back to say, we'll do it, we'll do it, because I'm not convinced we can. Uh, I'm, I'm worried that, in a sense, any kind of... I know the University of Limerick is very committed to, to psychotherapy training, but I, I'm worried generally that, that we've gotten very carried away with CBT, which I love, but, you know, we got carried away for the wrong reasons because it's it seen to be evidence-based and all that, which is very dubious stuff but we won't go there, but um, it's, it's, it's basically, um, it's short-term and sufficient and competent. The relapse rates from, you know, six sessions of CBT are about 90% or something. They're just, people don't stay well with that kind of, you know, and we're, we're dealing with very complex populations. So I think that overall, I would say psychiatry and real psychotherapy uh, rather, rather than psychiatry is, is a very endangered art. I think there's very little appreciation for what it can offer and how important it can be. And I think that's a great loss. I think we've gotten deluded into quick fixes and they will not work. And the idea that you can do like a weekend course or, you know, something, a very short course that will equip you in a, a skill to be able yeah, to give I, a certain I just think, you know, it's, it's, we need uh, most of the training that psychotherapists need are really is a training in how to relate to themselves um, and how to know themselves. And, 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 and because our biases, our blind spots, you know, when they emerge outside of our awareness. And so you need really good supervision to, to enable you to see that and understand why every time somebody cries, you change the subject. Well, that'd be a bit obvious, but you know, <laughs> But, but it could be true, you know, or, or every time somebody cries, you, you you kind of reach for a tissue and say it's OK, you know, mm -hmm. rather than let them cry. You know, what would happen? And and that that kind of mishandling of someone's pain is, is due to a, a lack of relationship with ourselves and a fear of, you know, directly experiencing our own lives. Uh, so a lot of training has to be personal you know it, it, it's not just out of a book yeah do you believe that that we can only bring a client as far as we've gone ourselves yeah yeah I do. that resonates with me as well yeah yeah it's pretty good if you can even do that much but <laughs> uh, but you know, because the problem is if you i'd say that uh, you can only bring a client to have somebody take hold of their life to the extent that you've really taken hold of your own and the extent that you've been really honest about your own biases, prejudices, fears, and so on. You've really had to kind of wrestle with those. They'll still be active mm. and they'll come out because they're bound to. But um, if at least you know what's happening, you know. They still come out. They're still coming. <laughs> I thought I'm going to find a cure someday and just be skipping yeah. around every day happy. <laughs> There's no cure for being human. There is no cure at all. I mean, we 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 befriend our our very um, you know broken inner lives. So some of which is gifted and strong, and some of which is full of things we're afraid of. And I, but we, I think integration is what we're looking for here, not overcoming or not getting rid of things. It's it's really giving them some sort of a place in our psychological. Uh, identity you know yeah. that they have a valid place and and not letting any one of them take up the whole dance floor i mean you don't want them to run away with the yeah. show um which they can do you know yeah um another thing i want to talk to you tony that's you're kind of touching on is like mindfulness i suppose and it's kind of become a buzzword it's kind of to the point where to me it's like what does that actually mean you know it's said so often that it kind of loses meaning but I know that it's been a big part of your life, I suppose. I, I would say it's probably been the single most important. It's not just a skill, but it's it's a, a philosophy. It's a, it's a way of looking at things. Um, and I would say that it, it has been 
you know, the most overarching and important. Because I think what it's taught me is that human beings suffer mostly because of out of their fear of directly experiencing themselves. Okay. And I think that, you know, again, the problem with the biomedical model is that it's all the time diverting people from any experience of themselves into other areas of, of treatment or the other kind of treatment plans. Now you don't have to go there. It's, 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 don't worry about that stuff. You know, the hurt, the pain, the anger, no, leave all that. We're going to sort this out, you know? Um, and I, I think that, you know, psychology also can fall into that trap of trying to, you know, alleviate symptoms, fix things, um, and give people clever little techniques that will get them through the night, uh, but at some point, people need to be allowed and enabled and empowered to safely experience themselves. And I've seen no methodology that's more, to me, persuasive than mindfulness, mm -hmm. which, you know, really takes care and time to build within people a capacity to steady themselves and to build, um, to build what we now call, you know, emotional regulation into somebody's life. And, and, and it does it in ingenious ways before it ever asks someone to look at difficult feelings or difficulties in their lives, you know. So mindfulness training, the first four stages. So, so I, I see it now being more about how to empower a person to really face in themselves, how to experience themselves directly. You know, mm. Lacan talks about the real, that behind the... The imagination, the language that we use to talk about what's real in a person's life, there is a kind of a basic subjective reality to, that they experience, and that mostly we get in the way, you know, that before they can even connect with that, we jump in. But I think what's wrong with you is your mother didn't love you, your father thought you were a loser, and you've never got over that. You know, we have these formulations that we jump in too quickly rather than, and, and I think, you know, Buddhism and, and, and Lacan and people like that are saying we have to sit with experience and really know it. And I think if I had one message in psychology, it is that, you know, we need to be allowing people to come closer to their own subjective experience of their lives. And that when they do that, things shift, mm -hmm. all kinds of things happen. And well, we need to do it in a way that, and mindfulness is a terribly uninvasive you know, it allows somebody to do this for themselves and gives them that skill. So I think it's a beautiful thing. And it's not a, a kind of a, you know, plaster over, you know, I think it's, it's really hard to do. It's, it's, it's very courageous. Um, and because you've got to face things, you've got to come out of hiding, you've got to be honest. Um, and I've done 10 day retreats and stuff I found in my head was even more disturbing than what I found after six years analysis. I did a course of time in analysis. Um, and that was pretty disturbing. <laughs> the, the 10 day retreat was worse. Um, so, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy to grow up, dear to People need to realize that it is not easy to grow up. Reality is way overrated. Maturity is way overrated. And it's much easier to sit back and just, you know, anesthetize yourself in whatever way you can and just Stay put, keep your head down, you know. Mm. What Tony Hoolan says, and don't question authority. <laughs> um, You're listening I, to the wrong Tony. <laughs> yeah, I know. That, yeah, that's right. I'm, yeah, um, he's a lovely guy, though. He always writes a great sense of humor. <laughs> I always remember him. Um, I, I think that's the point, you know, that um, it, it is really hard. It reminds me, actually, of a story from your book um, where you were speaking about a person with low self-esteem and they'd really rock bottom low self-esteem and they couldn't entertain the idea that they weren't like an absolute terrible person so you suggested can you imagine that either you're a terrible person or you're a person who thinks you're a terrible person and you said they could accept that oh, yeah. you know, they could reminded me of mindfulness it's like you're observing you're observing your experience. well that's it that's why the, the so, so what's common in both of those is a kind of a decentering. You, you know, you're not identifying with the self who's the loser. You're stepping back. This is a kind of a mentalization. You're, you're stepping back and you're reflecting. It's, it's the reflexive function. It's all of those things. And you're looking at what's happening, you know. But, but in that, there's a kind of a death of self because 
the me I thought I was that I was so upset with and making a song and dance about is suddenly I realize it's not even a me. It's just a set of thoughts and feelings. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a place I go when I, I feel threatened. Um, uh, and, and so you and you realize who, who, who I am is, is some kind of awareness that I can't quite pin down. And then you get comfortable with that. Um, and, and that's a huge achievement because I think you move into in cognitive adult cognitive development terms, you move from a kind of a socialized mind where you're in the club and you're in the tribe and you do whatever you know, you into a, a self-authoring mind uh, where you actually begin to make choices. I can do that, I can do this, I can do that, but I can also think, you know what, maybe I don't want to do that, and maybe I want to do something else. And 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 so um, and then that awareness, that self itself has to die as we move into a more what Robert Keegan calls self-transforming mind, which is which is which is a, a sense of interdependence, that there are lots of me's and lots of ways I can behave. Um, but it, I think mindfulness has all of that scope for people to move. You know, you can you can move way beyond just the ego into something far more exciting and fluid and dynamic which mm-hmm. is that sense of interbeing or interdependence so i think it's it's and it's you don't you don't have to do that you can start just practicing you know yeah. um and you don't think formal training is 100 percent necessary i always like to say uh, it sounds arrogant but it's not i'm the patron of the mindful teachers association of ireland so mm-hmm. um i had to they opened and they invited me and i had to speak to them and the first thing I said was you cannot teach people mindfulness which <laughs> seemed a very odd thing to say and what I meant by that is exactly what I said that it's it's an innate capacity in all of us to be present and to be um, aware and what we do in in um, the courses is just help to to strengthen that to nourish that and to show how different life is when we experience our ourselves, our breath, our you know our, our own experience, versus when we distract ourselves, which we spend most of our life doing. Um, and uh, I, I think there's a tremendous advantage. And I think we're going to have to make very complex decisions now. We've all had Tony running our life for us, or telling us Neffed, telling us how to live, and we haven't had to think. But actually, we're now going to have to take back our lives and begin to think, how do I want to live? And, you know, I think as we make really important decisions about our lives, we'll discover that we need to be in a place where we're not just grabbing at something, where we're actually speaking in our own voice, you know, where that we're actually being true to what, what we believe and feel is important. And I think so we need all of us to grow up, you know. This is, I think this is the task of the age to grow up. Otherwise you end up doing stupid things like Brexit. I mean, that's not a grown up adult decision. It's just, you know, a bad version of objection, you know, um, but uh, we need to do that. We all need to grow up. Um, and I think it's hard. And I think we're going to start looking in another way at mindfulness and say that actually this really has something important to offer. I, I think we see it as we, people do it to reduce stress and, and not get depressed. And that's really kind of not what it's about. I mean, that's certainly a, a, a wonderful knock on benefit, but it, it ain't what it's about. Mm. That's not. I saw a systematic review, though, recently, Tony, about um, using a mindfulness-based stress reduction course with people with um, hallucinations, auditory and visual hallucinations, and it was really, really successful. Yeah. Yeah, it came across sort of resounding, yes, this is effective. So I think it just reduce, it seems oh, to reduce I, I, suffering in general. Uh, yeah, no, no, but no, no, it helps. No, no, and I'd love to, I'd love to, I'd love if you would send me yeah, the link to that, uh, dear Dry, I think... I'm writing about the posters at the moment, and I'd really love to read. I, I also supervised a thesis a long time ago on, on mindfulness. Um, uh, it was about 2002, mindfulness and auditory hallucinations. And um, it didn't appear to do an awful lot, but everybody found that meeting every week, and we'd have to have cigarette breaks every 20 minutes, um, everybody found that meeting and discovering other people had hallucinations 
it normalized it and they became far less troubled by their auditory hallucinations. <laughs> but I'm not sure that was the point. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, no, no, I, I think that, um, yeah, I think it's great. And of course, I mean, I don't in any way, I think what it does, it steadies people. And it's maybe the first thing we should be doing with everybody is helping people to teach them how to stabilize, you know, in, in the yeah. event of any kind of emotional upset. Um, yeah. So it, it starts at the basis, but it goes all the way then into um, a, a very deep level of, exper of experience of life, a different way of experiencing life and seeing life. So it's, 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 there's nothing better I found in psychology. I think psychology is, is, is very close and I, I love what it's revealed and mapped for us, but um, mindfulness is bigger. It's, it, it's a kind of a bigger container than psychology mm -hmm. uh, for the human person. Um, yeah, so... Tony, I was wondering, I was in recent, it sounds going to sound weird now, but I was in mass the last day. <laughs> I've attended some like funeral masses for, to support friends recently. And I was kind of reflecting on, I was actually looking like objectively about what was being said in the mass, you know, and it's, I kind of was reflecting on how it's so different from what you're trying to do in therapy. Do you know, it was kind of saying you're inherently sin, you're sinful and you need to apologize for being sinful. And then I was thinking with coming up to this interview, as someone who's explored other philosophies and stuff, how do you think, do you think that's had an impact on the Irish kind of psyche? Other than obvious abuses, but I mean, just the message that we're... Yeah, I, 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 it's had a huge impact on my life. And I, I would, I would, you know, pray every day. I, I would, you know, I don't go to mass every week, but I would go to mass. And I, I kind of believe a lot in the gospel. Um, and it's very important. And I, I, there's no conflict at all between that and the, the, the mindfulness. Um, I, I don't buy that nonsense about, you know, I, I mean, I, I long ago realized I'm a, a you know, decrepit sinner and uh, should be ashamed of myself. Um, but, you know, I've been through enough of that. I've done that. Um, and I did it so faithfully and so well. Um, and I don't feel I'm even vaguely interested in that level of thinking. I think it's a very immature take on on what is a very spiritual, what is, it's a very mature take on the mystery of our lives and the beauty of our lives. And that's what I believe in. Mm. I believe in beauty and mystery. And I really, you know, I'm in awe of that. And I'm drawn towards that. And maybe that's God. And maybe it isn't. It may be he or she or it. I don't know. The further in my life I've come, the less I can even begin to speak that word. But I think it's a hugely important part of our lives, our spiritual longings, our, you know, wanting to the sense of something greater and being drawn by that. And I think it is impossible to talk about because you always sound silly when you do. And it's impossible for psychology, I think, to leave it out because mm -hmm. we started because you also do disrespect to that side of people. We started with, with looking at the soul, you know, and then they rewrote psychology. The whole history has kind of been rewritten and it made it sound like Bond in a, a laboratory for perception started psychology and it was all experimental science. That's not the way it started. It, it, it's, it, it has a different history. That's actually closely affiliated with Eastern philosophy. And that's where the, the, the psych you know, ology came from. And I, I think there is a sense that we need to, uh, even if we don't claim to understand it or want to talk about that element, we need to respect it in people's lives. And, you know, there is something beautiful about a funeral um, where you have a ritual that the Catholic Church has. I went to one recently. It was a beautiful funeral. Well, actually, I sat through... Ashley Murphy's funeral on the TV. Mm. And I had been at a humanistic one in, in, in a, you know, crematorium. And I found the humanistic one so flat. It was all about the person and how lovely they were and they were grand and they did this and that. And there was something really, there was nothing transcendent. And, and I came out of it feeling kind of a bit dead and flat, you know, like I just gorged on McDonald's or something, you know, which mm. was nice at the time, but very quickly gets old. And when I watched Ashlings, I thought what the priest said, it was, it was more about us and our lives. And, and it gave me, it fed me some, with something, gave me a sense that 
I could live and I was glad to be alive, you know. And I also had a sense, there was no magical, this woman flew off into heaven. There was nothing as simplistic as that, but yet it was predictable. It was ritualistic. It was communal. We all knew what was going to happen. And, and I felt very close to all those people, even though I wasn't even there and I didn't know her from Adam. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there was something, I think we need to understand that <laughs> these rituals serve as kind of pathways into mystery. You know, it's really hard to deal with death and think about, it. I mean, Newgrange, they thought about it for 5,000 years and built that thing and they were making a big statement and and that was their bible I mean that's that was the living three-dimensional 3d structure bible that was it here you are you know when things feel low when you die we are reborn in, into something and that's what the whole thing says and I think it's very difficult to talk about things so we need rituals and I think I think funeral masses are are a, such a ritual. I'll certainly have a funeral mass. I don't not want a humanistic one. And it's just, I, I've been at two or three now and they just, I don't know. They just feel like it's, you know what I mean? I want a bit of depth, you know? So I think we just need to get over ourselves and our biases. We all are very angry at the church for what happened. But mm. you know what? The whole society is living with that wound and it's festering and we haven't begun to address it. And we need to be doing that. And we need to, I read um, Derek Scully's book, The Best Catholics in the World, which was really, for me, the best book I read last year. Um, it was superb. And I had prepared it to review it on the radio. Um, and literally the Friday before the Sunday interview, I'd sent in all my notes. They said, um, we can't do this. You know, it's too... It's too raw for people. We're not ready to talk about this. And I think the producer was right. She wasn't, you know, she, she was just thinking about, and I thought, I thought her ability to take the pulse of the nation was way better than mine. Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought, isn't that interesting that we, we really, we're just about able to talk about the civil war. I mean, that's pushing it at the moment. <laughs> but, yeah. but, you know, we're not able to talk, and the famine, it took us till 1990 to talk about that. And, and Sinead O'Connor started that. But I mean, we, we can't talk about the traumas that we were all involved in. We were all bystanders in these things. We weren't just innocent, uh, you know, with, you know, it, 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 was, it, it, it was our society that produced Madonna Homes and all these institutions, and we conspired with those. Yeah. So we have a lot to look at, all of us. And I think psychology should be interested in how we, um, in not sort of scapegoating the church, but looking at a much broader community, taking a much broader community perspective and, and thinking, how can we help Ireland to, to heal from that time? Mm. What kind of process, what kind of, if you could think of Ireland as a client, what kind of therapeutic intervention would you do? Because I think Ireland is stuck and will keep repeating those things until we deal with it, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, no, no, I, 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 but we do need rituals, some, you know, different ways to, to enter mystery. And that's yeah. what those those things do at their best. I just think the message is very different. Um, like if you listen to kind of Buddhist Dharma and things, it's saying like, you know, you inherently have a goodness in you. And in the Catholic Church, in Catholic are Church, terrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and we and are right, and you are wrong. <laughs> you are basically innocent. Yeah, you're basically good. Um, yeah. And and I think we, you know, that's what I believe, you know, uh, and, um, but I do think that the, the, the larger message, the, the way the church uh, kind of wraps up religion and packages and gets people on side is a lot of, a lot of public manipulation. It's a lot of what, you know, society does to keep certain things mm -hmm. under their control. So, I mean, you gotta let that nonsense go. I, I mean, I think, you know, the basic message I hear of Christianity is to love others um, because they are, every one of them are have dignity and, and are deserving of your love and, and deserving of as much love that as, as you would like for yourself. You know, that's pretty amazing. You know, I mean, if you could bring that into the psychiatric system, I would love it that we 
just, if you could just restore if you could, a vision that every human being in there has dignity mm. and we're not going to just write them off as order, you know? Um, if dignity was the, and this was in Vision for Change, but it's kind of more subtly in there, but if dignity was the metric that we measured quality of service, to what extent people felt connected with their own dignity? Um, and that's, to me, a very Christian message. And it, it you know, it, it is that there is goodness in people and, and, and there's a whole lot of things in people and they still need love and they still deserve it. I mean, that's, you know... Um, that's pretty radical, you know? Uh, so I I, uh, I just think let's not, let, let's our discussions about religion in this country move beyond kindergarten to a, another level, you know, mm. uh, because uh, it is, it's seriously stuck just like some families are and some people are, but we don't write them off. You know, we say, okay, they need to grow up. Let's see, can we help, you know? That's what I think. Um, I, have a I think we should get rid of all the costumes, all the wealth, all the money, and just go back to like mass rocks. <laughs> we all go to just a rock. <laughs> yeah, well, and no one has any money. It's or funny. I I did a workshop. I spent a work actually a two day workshop with Ordi Lang. Um, you know Ordi Lang. If actually, I haven't heard of. Him. No, well, well, Ordi Lang was sort of the leading anti psychiatrist. Uh, psychiatrist. Uh, back in the sixties, and he was he was um, he was quite a charismatic figure and quite a, and a brilliant mind, um, and uh, wrote widely. But, um, but um, I he was kind of disrespected mostly within his own community, and he was seen to be somewhat of a an, an idiot, really. Um, and. I, I, I went, he came to, we brought him to Dublin, um, Ivor Brown, Vince Kenny, myself, and we, we brought him over to do two days. And he, um, but he also had to, he also had to meet the Irish branch of the British psychiatry, whatever. Um, and there was about 400 of them. And he, he then after that went to the Late Late Show and it's become famous. He was drunk on the Late Late Show and Gay Byrne said, you're drunk. And this whole and he said, How dare you? And when he was drunk as a skunk. Um, and the next day he turned up in Garden Hill and he turned up in a three piece suit, um, absolutely sobered up. And he, um, he, I, I, he had a most beautiful mind. I mean, he was very bright. I think his frustration was he couldn't live the vision he had of what he wanted to see happen. But he, um, somebody asked him at one point, he said, What is psychotherapy? You know? And bear in mind now, this is there wasn't so much of it going around in, in the early days. Um, and he said, you know, he said, psychotherapy. He said, I don't really know what it is. He said, but um, there's a guy who wrote, somebody who wrote a, a line where two or three are gathered in my name. There I am among them. Now he said, that guy got psychotherapy because he said, that's what it is. That mm -hmm. we're sort of, we, we, we gather with, somebody but we gather in a way that that allows and creates something else to happen you know something really beautiful um uh, and where there is mystery and where there is openness and possibility of, of really goodness coming through and i thought this guy who had you know been uh, anyway i just thought it was beautiful yeah, so I, I don't think he was a mass going catholic by the way but i would i just still think there are truths that are worth um, salvaging, yeah, and, uh, and I, I, I just feel. I think it's it, 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 in a word I would summarize it as dignity. I think that's the thing we have to most restore. Um, mm. And and you know I, I worked in psychiatric hospital for thirty years, and there were people who really did respect the dignity of patients. I mean, there was we had real lunatics in there. You know, completely out of their head. You know, and we have reason because of medication they were on but I mean I remember one nurse Phyllis and she would talk to each of them kind of like that they were her children but not in a patronizing way you know just in a very tender way and a very respectful way and she didn't care what labels they had or you know she she Deirdre was Deirdre and Kate was Kate and Mary was Mary and Tony was Tony and it just 
And she knew each of them and she knew how to coax them and how to calm them. And she, she was, for me, the best model of how to treat psychiatric patients that I came across in 30 years. It wasn't any consultant or any psychologist. Mm. It, was, it was her. Um, she lived it right on the front lines. I also saw nurses beat patients and tie them down and do terrible things. I mean, you know, it wasn't outside the bounds that somebody would just, you know, wallop somebody if they were acting up. Um, mm. So I saw, I'm not, I'm not romanticizing any of this. I'm just saying that there are good people and we need to be those good people as psychologists. And we need to recognize there are psychiatrists who are just as good. Yeah. You know, but the culture of it is for me a very bankrupt one. It's not, it's not healthy. Yeah. So we've come to the end. Thank you so much, Johnny. My final question is always, what are three things in your mental health toolbox that you use to look after your mental health? Um, well, I would say um, mindfulness is number one, without a doubt. Um, uh, playing the piano is number two. And I think um, number three is a toss up between um, I live on a headland, so I have lovely walks, you know, and I mean, today isn't lovely now, it's rainy and damp, but I still go out. Um, and that's that's been very healing, my garden, my animals in the garden, my chickens. Um, so there's a toss up between, you know, exercise and and whiskey. I mean, whiskey is very important. It's also, <laughs> I'll, I'll have a glass of whiskey in the evening and uh, that's, you know, it, it was my idea for getting off drinking too much wine during lockdown is that I'll leave that go the wine and just have one really gorgeous. So it's worked beautifully. I, I, I think um, uh, I know and I haven't, you know, once or twice I've gone overboard, but generally I'm OK. I just have that glass and I just um, I'm happy with that. And that's my, you know, and I, I think that's a very important. We need some way to. Playing the piano does it for me. I mean, you, but you know, you need some way to relax. You've got to, you can't live up on the top floor um, of your mind trying to sort things out all the time. You need to, you need to kind of, you need the occasional blowout, you know, just, mm. just to really let it go. Um, yeah. uh, and, um, I, and I'm saying that, you know, advisedly knowing how much all the rest. It's almost politically incorrect to say that now because you know, somebody is hurting because of somebody drinking whiskey, I'm sure. But you know what? Um, I still think, uh, you know, we, we, we need, yeah. But I, I certainly, mindfulness is, is, is the kind of basis now for me. I, 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 I move out of that space. And I, uh, for a long time, it was, you know, a discipline, a difficulty. I hated it and all that and nothing much happened. And then... I, now it's it's like it's something I truly love to do, and I, I do yoga and exercises, and then I sit. And the thing about it I've discovered is this: maybe this is important in ten, but is that um, mindfulness is a bit like in Plum Village, where Thich Nhat Han has set up, and he died just last Sunday. I mean, he died last Sunday week, but he was buried last Sunday, uh, ninety five. But he. Um, their definition, they're sort of the gold standard, I suppose, for mindfulness practice. And, and their definition was that mindfulness is the awareness that arises when we take time to pay attention in a certain way. OK, so what I realized is that I cannot predict the awareness that will arise and. Um, in a way, it's kind of what psychoanalysis called insight, you know, but I can, so when I practice now, it's kind of, I mean, I'm not expecting any one thing to happen, but I'm open to what always does happen, which is that some awareness comes to me in that space, which can often be, I need to put the bin out today. I mean, it could be that, you know, but it more often is something deeper, you know, um, it could be I'm writing something and I just completely missed the point. And then a very simple phrase comes to me that is the, is the sort of key that turns the whole thing around, you know. Yeah. Um, so or something about living, about what I need to, what is most important. And some awareness comes. But I think 
so I see mindfulness as not just calming down, but more and more as an opening up and listening. And I am just always fascinated to see what comes. And it doesn't let me down. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tony, for doing for doing this today. I've really been looking forward to it. Thanks a million. Well, I think I took a lot of your time and I, I, I'm worried you're going to have to edit this thing for the next year. Oh, um, 